Welcome to another show of Celebrate Life. My name is Gary DeCarlos, and I'll be your host today again. And the whole point of this show is to really capture and celebrate the lives of Vermonters and once in a while, someone from outside of Vermont. And I, the inspiration for this, for me, came from, oh, from a, years of reading obituaries and finishing them up and saying, gosh, I wish I really got to know this person. What a special human being they were. And so my feeling is let's celebrate life while we're still here and vibrant and alive and doing great things. And so that's why this show has been around. We, this is about almost a year anniversary now. I'm a firm believer that everyone has a story to tell. If you would like to tell your story, um, send me an email at celebratelife0747 at gmail.com. Or if you have a question for our guest today, please send, again, send me an email at celebratelife0747 at gmail.com. Well, I'm very honored to have as our guest today, Sally Borden, who's an indomitable force for the protection and safety of children in this state. And Sally's been doing this for a year and just a wonderful human being on top of it. So I'd like to welcome you, Sally. And thank you for allowing us to celebrate your life today. Thank you, Gary. I'm looking forward to it. Good. So um, well, take us back, Sally, to where it all started. Where, where did you grow up as a little girl? And tell us about your life back then. Well, okay, so um, I my earliest years were in Montana. That was like a beautiful environment to live in. I have three sisters and we're all um, within five years. Our spread is five years, which- My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think about that now, oh my gosh. But um, yeah, so we're all really close in age. Um, I'm second oldest. So we lived there. And then um, when I was six, we uh, had the opportunity, due to my father's um, employment, to go to Spain for two mm. years. And so we lived there. And um, that was a, a bit of a shock as a, you know, I English bet. speaking. My parents tried to prepare us for a few Spanish words to start with. But um, they wisely, I think, put us and um, uh, we learned really quickly, like within two months, we were mm. you know, as little kids, we were bilingual. Um, and so that was, um, that was a great experience. And when you're a kid, you, you know, you don't know that this is way, way back, of course, yep. um, you know, that there's a dictatorship and all of those things. We didn't know any of that. We just you know, um, as kids, just uh, appreciated yeah. in a new environment, learning new stuff, meeting new friends. And uh, yeah. so, so yeah. Where in Spain, Sally? In Madrid. Madrid, my okay, Madrid. yeah. My father was teaching at the University of Madrid. Okay. Uh, and he had a, a Fulbright, um, you know, placement there. And so, um, yeah, so it was, it was uh, quite an experience. I think it's a, yeah. it's a great experience looking back. Um, and, um, and we traveled around Spain a bit and, and got to see a lot. Um, and then when we came back, just due to a bunch of different circumstances, again, around my, um, my father's employment, uh, because he was a very political, I would say, and um, had certain political, very liberal political leanings. And um, as it turned out, it, it he received an offer to teach at the University of California at Santa Barbara. And hmm. um, so we ended up moving from Montana, um, not such a liberal place, to uh, Southern California. And um, uh, and that was, um, you know, again, a big, a big change. Yeah, yeah. So. You know, so, Sally, they say that um, one of the ingredients for people who are system change people, people who is to have an out of tribe experience. In other words, if you lived in Montana and you went to Spain and then you're going to, you saw 
saw values and ways of living outside of the normal way everyday life would be, which opens people up to thinking differently and bigger. Is that true for you? You know, I think only upon reflection, you know, do you really realize that? um, that, But yeah, I absolutely believe that um, having broader life experiences, whatever they are, within whatever context you are in. So, um, you know, for some people, it might be moving two towns over or, you know, others, you know, it's something really different. But yeah, I think... um, Exposure to a lot of different kinds of people is helpful. And um, I think on reflecting, reading, we were a big reading family. And, um, you know, just learning about lots of different people all over the world. And um, that I think that also helps give one a broader perspective. Yeah. What was your father's field? History, American history. Okay. Uh Uh So, yeah. Uh And he was, um, you know, he was quite, uh, quite a dominant force in in my life and all of our lives. Um, And really pretty, and a very amazing person. But, um, but he was sort of El Profesor. I mean, he was that kind of person who Mm. you uh, certainly, you know, I don't know, you'd say he filled up a room, but he didn't go unnoticed wherever, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, not in a flamboyant, flamboyant way, but just that um, he had a very strong personality. Yep. yep. So, yeah. So there you were in Santa Barbara. Yeah. And so then, you know, I guess as, as I was kind of thinking about defining moments in my life, some were great and some, you know, some not so much. So, really one of the biggest defining moments is that when I was nine, my, my mom passed away Mm -hmm. and um, she had cancer. It was all pretty sudden. And of course they didn't have the kind of treatments then (laughs) that they do now. So, um, you know, she went to the doctor, not kind of knowing what was wrong. And then it was all pretty fast. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and as a kid, I remember feeling like a phrase that I had read in a book, which was that I felt like the whole bottom of my world had fallen out. That feeling of, you know, everything's gone. Yeah. And um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, that was a really hard thing. And four little kids and my dad and um, Mm. uh, just, you know, dealing, dealing with that. Devastating, yeah. Yeah, and I I think now looking back and what I know about trauma now, I think, um, you know, I guess I understand it a little bit better, sort of all of our reactions and things, all each different reactions, but, you know, it clearly um, impacted the whole rest of my life. And and when you're little, I think, I mean, like I, um, she was just, she was just there, right? She was my Mm -hmm. mom, she was just Mm -hmm. there. Mm-hmm. And um, and then she's gone, sort of like yeah. you're, you're like air, you know, like it's, yeah. it's just gone. It's what you are, and it's gone. Yeah. So really, that. And now, as I, you know, as I understand trauma a little bit better, I understand that um, and know that how people around you respond is really important mm. to how you process things. And yes. so I have to say that you know, out of every every difficult thing there are you know rays of sunshine and um uh looking back there was a very special teacher in my life she was um she was my third grade teacher and she was my first teacher when we moved to California and um she uh I was in fourth grade then and she invited me back to third grade to be a teacher's helper because walking back into the classroom and all your peers and that was really hard so Mm -hmm. she had me come back and be her special helper and you know I think about that like how wise what a wise person to have done that um and she was so kind and kind to me and my sisters and um kind of a funny thing she she later she sewed these little dresses so we all had these matching dresses and they were so cute 
<laughs> I've seen, I, and, yes. Yeah. So I think, you know, Beautiful. like what a thoughtful thing. Yes. A thoughtful thing to do. And Absolutely. Uh, so, and my, you know, again, yeah, my dad, um, you know, beyond being devastated, suddenly had these four, four kids. Yeah. Care for, or, you know, or not. And, and um, again, this is, this is the mid sixties. So being a single dad of, you know, raising us by himself, but he was very determined to do that and do it mm-hmm. himself. And in retrospect, he's really my hero. He is the person who had the biggest influence on my life. And um, he chose, um, again, somebody advised him, keep their routine. So he kept us in school, kept us, you know, and, um, you know, one of my great memories now, <laughs> it wasn't so much mm-hmm. then, but, you know, every morning he would be up and he would um, get us, you know, have our breakfast ready and tell us to go get dressed and then, you know, come for breakfast. And he would have these four little um, brown bags all set out on the counter for school. Uh, And, um, you know, it was usually butter and jelly every day, but that's okay. Um, And uh, so, yeah, it's really incredible when I think Mm. about, um, you know, being a dad um, in the mid sixties and yes. taking that on. And, and he was fortunate. He had a, a job that could be pretty flexible and, yep. you know, that kind of thing, but yep. he, um, you know, he worked really hard. He had to, you know, he wrote books and you have to publish right when you're, yep. when you're a professor. And so he would get up, you know, at 4am and, and write and then be ready for the day. And then, um, you know, and then that's go amazing. And, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, so, yeah, when I think about like what really impacted my life, that did. And then mm-hmm. seeing, you know, how he handled that on the on the downside, he was super strict. I mean, he was so <laughs> protective of us. And um, that was OK when we were little as teenagers. Not not so much. But right. uh, but yeah, I mean, I understand that better now. Um, right yeah when you have kids of your own you kind of understand that for protectiveness and especially when you've lost mm-hmm. somebody dear so mm-hmm. nice to hear yeah. a good story about a man yeah you know? <laughs> yeah he, he and I didn't always see eye to eye but he was a pretty um you know pretty amazing person so oh, that's great. Yeah. yeah so you were in Santa Barbara <clears throat> and then how did you get to Vermont Oh, yeah. Well, (laughs) well, I got to uh, Massachusetts first. So um, from Santa Barbara, I went to college at UC Davis, which was great. I love UC Davis. And um, I was really interested in political science. And it's located close to Sacramento. And I did an Mm. internship with my state assemblyman and and, um, Mm. uh, got involved in campaigns, things like that, and was really interested in politics. And Mm. So, um, so went to UC Davis and then, um, after college, I got a job as a residence hall director and, um, at UMass Amherst. So when I graduated, I moved, I actually lived for a summer with my aunt and uncle in New York and was, um, interviewing at a lot of different places and, um, ended up at U, at UMass which was a total change. It's a you know big campus and yeah. residence hall towers and, and very different. But um, again, a great experience. Oh, what a learning experience. And there, maybe you know, because of the age I was, I, I had much a, a much greater appreciation of um, you know, just sort of the diversity of students and mm. um, people from all over. I had never heard a South Boston accent before. So, you know, <laughs> it was all, all different. Um, but uh, that was a great job. Um, and so I lived in Massachusetts for quite a while. After that job, I, um, I moved to Northampton and had um, gotten a job with uh, victim witness assistance in the DA's office, which mm. um, really combine my interest in justice and uh and and you know the whole legal justice system and 
um, and sort of the helping helping people, the helping professions. Um, and so victim assistance really um, brought that together. And I, I got into that in actually a, um, an unfortunate but interesting way. As a residence hall director, um, my, I had it like an apartment on the first floor of one of these big, no, not a tower, mm -hmm. but a big residence hall. And a student in my dorm was assaulted and ran down to, to me and okay. to my apartment. And so I ended up being a witness on that case. Mm -hmm. and became very familiar with victim witness assistance. And I said, that's the job I want. That is exactly what I want to do. Mm -hmm. So that was really the start of my career in um, sort of the helping professions and, um, and, and seeking justice. Yes. Um, so, yeah, so I did that for a number of years. I became the director of victim witness assistance for um, what's called the Northwestern District. So that's Northampton, Greenfield, that whole oh, yeah. Northern Mass area. And then um, after I did that for quite a while, I became the director of training for the state of Massachusetts uh, Victim Office of Victim Assistance. Wow. Um, so I, you know, I, I really appreciated that and the opportunity to um, to make an impact in that in that oh. way. Um, and then uh, I met my husband there. Kind of funny story. We met at the YMCA, had a gym, and we both happened to be working out. <laughs> a, great, <laughs> a great 1980s story. <clears throat> Um, and so um, the funny part is that he had a George McGovern in 72 t-shirt on and I said something uh, really clever like, gee, I like your shirt. And um, <laughs> that started a conversation. Uh, and it went from there. So, uh, um, but it so happens that um, Joe is a uh, born and raised Vermonter and um so rather, so through a uh, rather circuitous route, we did end up back in Vermont. We went to California, back to California for me first. We lived in the Bay Area, mm. and um, I he worked at a um, community health center there, and I worked at I got a job as um, the executive director at a domestic violence agency that had a shelter and legal program and transitional housing. Mm all of those things. And um, so that was a, a really important step, sort of, Absolutely. you know, being a director of a <clears throat> small struggling agency that never had enough money, but, um, but did really valuable work. Um, and while we were there, we um, uh, had decided, you know, on, on our family plans and ran into some some challenges with um, with our original you know trajectory and um, looked into adoption and we came across this um, approach to adoption that we didn't really know anything about which was open adoption and when we heard about it we went to this information center and somebody was talking about it and it was um, a birth mother who had chosen open adoption mm. um, to um, to place her baby. And um, they continued to have some contact. And yeah. she, I think the most important thing was that she felt like she had a choice, you know, about mm. what, what was going to happen to this baby. And mm. um, that just struck both Joe and I. Joe's a, um, has his master's degree in social work, that's his background. And you know, it was so important to both of us mm -hmm. to not feel like we were part of a system that was maybe exploiting people in any right, way. Or, right. Um, so we, when we heard that, we we're like, "That's what we. That's what we should do." And yeah. so it felt like a bit of a leap. Nowadays, that's much more common, but back then, of course, it wasn't. And mm -hmm. um, so we went through the whole process for that, and um, we were picked by a birth mother um, and we started planning for this, you know, wonderful new arrival in our lives. 
And then she went into labor a week early or two weeks early or something. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, you know, I had a big, you know, contract meeting that day and Joe had something and we're like, yep, never mind. <laughs> and we figured everything out and we quickly drove. Um, it was a couple hours away from where we lived in the Bay Area where she lived. And um, uh, we were supposed, we, had, we hadn't actually met. We were supposed to talk that that day. Mm-hmm. Uh, she went into labor so wow so um it was all very quick we grabbed a car seat from my sister who lived nearby and we figured oh everything else we can manage <laughs> and so we did um and this absolutely beautiful perfect little little human came into <laughs> our lives and it was very touching i mean they they had he had been born by the time we got there and um in the hospital they had removed him from right away knowing that her plan was adoption and and so we talked with her about you know after meeting <laughs> hello and how you doing um yeah. you know talked with her about how would she how would she want to do this and, mm-hmm. and so um when we had the nurse come back in and hand him to her and then she handed him to us oh, that's, and that that's was really nice. sweet and yeah um so yeah, it was a you know one of those amazing adoption stories, and you know we didn't necessarily plan it this way, but we ended up having contact with her, um, and then her family um, at the time. She didn't have family, but then she um, ended up getting married a year later and having two other kids, and we we had contact with them for um, just about every month for um, the next couple of years. Wow. And um, and then, you know, we stayed in touch for a long time. That was one of our commitments when we moved back to Vermont was to keep in touch mm-hmm. um, and make sure that our son, Daniel, knew his birth family. Mm-hmm. And, um, and she's Filipino. And so we wanted to make sure we wrote down Filipino, you know, Tagalog words on the refrigerator. And, you know, we, yep. we couldn't provide all of that. But we knew that if we stayed in touch with her, he would always have that part of his identity. Um, Fantastic. Yeah, so we when we would come back to California after moving to Vermont, um, we would always go see them and make sure that they had special time together and, mm. and um, all of that. And in fact, when her oldest daughter after, after Dan was born, she asked if we'd babysit <laughs> and take care of it. So it was, oh you my know, goodness. just never would have envisioned that. That's but it was, amazing. It was pretty neat. We, we were more of kind of like a special aunt and uncle sort of relationship. Yeah. Um, and she, she, Oh, do you mind? She just, I'm thinking of this one quote that, you know, she always said this and it really struck me. She said um, to me one day, she said, I have sadness, but no regrets. Mm. And wow. That, you Mm. know, that really. That's beautiful. So. And this, uh, what has it meant for Daniel to have that connection continue? No, I think it's, um, it's, important and valuable i i steadfastly maintain that's the right way to do this when you can yeah and it's not safe yeah. for all situations and right. not appropriate but whenever possible i think it's so important but i will say that, you know there were some hard times with that and i think some identity stuff and who am i really and mm-hmm. that i think um adopted kids most often go through and exactly. um well that maybe was mitigated by knowing you know knowing her and and um her circumstances and everything um it's still hard you know yeah yeah like absolutely but I, you hear a lot of of children who have been adopted that don't have that connection and they're constantly wondering about the birth parent or parents and it sounds like this kind of was a bridge for Daniel with that as tough as it is. Anyhow, I mean, you can't take that away, but that's bravo to you, Sally, for doing that. You and Joe. Well, you know, it just felt, we kind of felt like (laughs) 
we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> like any parent, we don't know what we're doing, but we think this seems like the right, <laughs> the right thing to do. And, um, you know, there was definitely a period of time where he didn't have connection and her l- whole life circumstances changed as well. And we all kind of lost contact, but, um, but the really sweet thing is that uh, resumed contact with his birth half sisters. Oh, and, nice. Um, and so did so Melissa. I kind of skipped over Melissa in there. She got born, but <laughs> we'll come back to that. But, okay. So when we would go visit, Melissa was actually you know closer in age, and um, you know we had a bit of a you know friendship with mm-hmm. um, his two birth half sisters, and so. Um, so they've maintained some connection and just a few months back, Daniel went to, um, the wedding of his, one of his birth sisters. Wow. Really, you know, he's maintained that connection and he did see his birth mother at that time too. He hasn't maintained a close connection, but I think, Mm -hmm. um, you know, hopefully that's, that's step by step that's resuming to to some extent but yep. I, but to see the sibling or you know yes or whatever that relationship is so important that's, that's so, wonderful that's, yeah now when you went back to san francisco was uh your dad still out there and your sisters yeah yeah my parents were um so i did <laughs> i skipped over stuff moving forward so very importantly so my dad remarried um you know a few years after my mom passed away mm-hmm. and so um, I have a wonderful stepmother um uh, Penn mm-hmm. who um you know who was very much an important part of our lives and wisely didn't didn't um try to be mother per se but mm-hmm. uh, but had such an important parent role partly in, in um, helping um, buffer some of my father's uh, strictness and, ah, uh, yes. <laughs> and lack of understanding of four girls, especially four teenage girls. Right. But, um, so she was, um, she was a really important force. And um, then after my dad passed away, which was after we moved back here, um, you know, we just continued a very, very close relationship. She was a wonderful person and she just passed away uh, pretty recently, about a year and a half ago. Okay. So, um, so yeah, but we would go see my parents a lot. And then um, we were living in California, had this wonderful toddler running around. And um, uh, as is often the case, big surprise I was pregnant and so so our our daughter was um, ready to come along and in the meantime just sort of at that time um, Joe um, we were here in Vermont for um, holiday to see his family here and he saw an ad for the um, community health center for the executive Mm. director position Mm. and he applied and they offered it to him right away. And so we went wow. back to California and he um, he started work there on a contract position while we were kind of trying to decide what do we do? And so I stayed in California with Daniel most of the time. Some of the time Daniel came here with Joe and we did this back and forth thing and um, uh, then decided that you know, that wasn't workable. <laughs> and I found out I was pregnant, which was a big surprise. And so we were actually pursuing a second adoption. And so mm. we went forward with that and um, decided, um, you know, that that was going to be just not right. too much. To, yes. So, um, so we made the decision to move to Vermont. I stayed in California for, for quite a while. Um, you know, just finishing up my job, finishing just, a, we really wanted to make sure that this is what we wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and so um, meanwhile, once we decided, Joe started, you know, looking for houses and I, um, I said, fine, just send me pictures. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> sure. <laughs> Much pickier about that stuff than I am. So um, found a great, great house. And so I flew on the last day I could fly and still have it covered by insurance if I went into labor on the airplane. <laughs> the one word that um, I think of sometimes is pragmatic. I'm very pragmatic that way. <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> we got to deal with this reality. Yes. Um, so, yeah, so we um, came here and had a house with no furniture and um, and a baby on the way. <laughs> yeah, you just deal with it. And it was wonderful. And we were happy to be here. And um, and I think, you know, Joe especially loved the community health center and um, uh, just it was really nice to be in Vermont. And I love Vermont. Um, mm -hmm. I wasn't sure, but I think, mm -hmm. you know, I'm I'm in some ways more of a Vermonter than he is. <laughs> Not really, <laughs> but um, but I love it here and, yeah. you know, just really appreciate what a gift we have to live here. Mm -hmm. and, the environment and the lake and the people and um you know definitely some shortcomings that you know we all need to work towards making it more welcoming and um a comfortable environment for for everyone yeah um, but no doubt so it's a really special place it is a special place and you help make it special sally <laughs> so you did you get the, the kids safe collaborative job <laughs> soon after when did that come? Oh, yeah, so um, so I was able to, well, one big advantage of living in Vermont at that time versus the Bay Area was I had the privilege of being able to stay home for a little while um, mm -hmm. with the kids. And so I, I did that for a little bit. Um, and then about 18 months later, or you know, somewhere around there, um, Joe had actually heard about this job <laughs> through his work connection. And um, the original job was to manage a, a big federal grant called the Safe Kids Safe Streets Grant. And he said, I think I found the perfect job for you. And I was like, I'm not, I'm not sure I want a job. I'm perfectly happy with this. But, um, but I checked into it. And um, uh, it was um, such a, uh, just such an important opportunity to bring um, the broader community together and support how um, how we value kids, you know, children and youth and families um, within the framework of our child welfare and justice systems. Mm -hmm. And um, it was different, it was different than, you know, because it's, um, very cutting edge, really, when you think yeah. about it, the way it was just this whole collaborative approach. And so this organization was Community Network for Children, Youth and Families. It was a partnership of a lot of the community organizations in the community and um, that provide different social services, you know, mm -hmm. Howard Center and Lund Center and um, Spectrum and all of those. And so I was kind of coming into this established collaborative process with the opportunity to really build our work around children's, um, you know, health, safety, and well-being. Yeah. Wow. So I was offered the job, decided that was, <laughs> that was kind of my destiny. And, mm -hmm. um, and it was a five-year grant, five and a half year grant. And so I thought this is perfect. It's very time limited. It's not going to absorb my whole life like, frankly, the domestic violence agency job did. And um, uh, I'll do this for five years and then eh, figure out what I want to do next. And Gary, it's 24 years later and I'm still <laughs> here. Still cooking. <laughs> yeah, I, I love it. I think it's so unique and it's such a unique opportunity to, um, you know, both impact um, how children and families are treated within the broader child welfare system, yes. not just DCF family services, but the broader system, um, you know, sort of on an, on an individual basis. And then look at the larger systems issues right. and the policy issues and, um, right. and be able to impact that as well. Um, 
So it, it, it brings all the different parts of you together. I mean, you know, from your father taking care of four little girls to, um, <laughs> you know, to a, a, an open adoption and how that went. So you saw kind of an ideal situation and then, and then dealing with the child welfare system as it is, with the positives and negatives, you, could, you had perspective on all this going in. Yeah, I think about um, yeah how all of those things sort of um, are cumulative in shaping yeah. our you know worldview, um, and I think um, you know fundamentally I, I feel like I'm somebody who really looks at just part of who I am is you know do the right thing you know what what's right and what's right and good and fair. Yeah. And this job in its own way um, really um, is the opportunity to, to yeah. do that and to impact that in my community. Yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah. Sally, I have a question for you. Okay. Most of the jobs that you ended up getting, you end up being the executive director. Now, <laughs> you're, you know, you're not a line staff person here. You're, you're, you're in leadership <laughs> roles. Where does that come from? I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, I, I, um, I think it's um, and goes back to something you said earlier, which is maybe that ability to see the bigger picture mm -hmm. and to want to be able to impact that in a broader way, mm -hmm. and so. Um, I, I have really appreciated the line staff positions I've had. I think about, um, you know, even as a residence hall director and the range of situations that you deal with. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's a lot. Yeah. And then um, as a victim witness advocate, sometimes I say that was the best job I ever had um, because I loved that. Working with somebody who has... Um, who has been victimized is such a devastating thing. Yeah. And then to have that um, compounded by our, our criminal justice system that doesn't always um, value the, you know, the, the position that a victim has, something happened to them, and sometimes our court system sort of seems to, um, you know, overlook that. And so I had an opportunity early in the days in Massachusetts, Victim Bill of Rights, and um, working, you know, in that one-on-one -on -one way was profound. Mm. Um, so I try and always bring that. And even when I became the director of Victim Witness, I always kept cases myself because I thought it was really important to have that experience in going, going into court mm -hmm. um, and just sitting there with the victim and dealing with whatever, you know, whatever the prosecutor did, the defense attorney, the judge, um, uh, bearing witness to that with a victim um, or a witness of crime is profound and yeah. it's so hugely important. And I think that has shaped my view. And um, then I also have a passion for looking at, well, how can we make things even better? Well, that takes a broader perspective. Like you said, yes. that's, the, that's yes. the systems and um, having the opportunity to impact that is um, uh, an honor, I guess I would say. So. That's great. Yeah, Mike. You, you bring that all together in this job beautifully. Um, yeah. What keeps you going? <laughs> well, you know, the other things I, well, as a parent, you know, that that, um, <laughs> that can also be the most humbling of all experiences. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, what keeps me going in my work is very much, um, you know, I have such a privilege of working with amazing people, not just here in the Kids Safe Collaborative office, but again, my job is working with a lot of different people in the community. And um, 
that's how I met you and yep, um, right. others who do amazing work. And um, so that keeps me going, quite honestly, mm -hmm. knowing that sometimes it's two steps forward, one step back, or sometimes the change is incremental. But I feel like we and I have an opportunity to make our community a better place. And then at the same time, I think, um, like I said, having the experience of being a parent um, uh, is both tremendously rewarding and can be tremendously challenging. And so um, I, I talked to both my kids before doing this, made sure it was okay to share this, but um, in particular, my son, who you know, um, struggled with substance use disorder for many years. And I think, you know, thinking back, I, you know, kind of like what caused it or, you know, there's so many different factors that come together. I mean, he's an amazing, amazing grown up now, but he was an amazing child. He was yeah. bright and energetic and um, loving. We were, mm -hmm. we were a fresh air family, actually, for many years. We had a fresh air son who came every year, every summer um, till he was, um, I think 18, 17 or 18. And, um, you know, they were just, they were brothers. They were, they did everything together. They played baseball and, you know, little league and all that stuff and, um, uh, or summer rec league, I guess it was, but, um, you know, they just did all that stuff. He was just that kind of a, a kid. Yeah. Um, and somewhere in, you know, around middle school age, life got more challenging for him. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, looking back many, many reasons. He, he didn't learn in the same way as other kids. Mm -hmm. um, he was a bit challenged by school. He was um, small in stature. He um, was one of the only kids of color in the school district. Mm -hmm. um, so as much as you try and do as a parent to support your child, um, you know, he, he yeah. faced challenges that we couldn't you know, couldn't or in some way didn't, um, you know, we weren't able to really give him enough to be able to, to deal with those challenges in a healthier way. And so he, you know, he had a really, really, really tough time behaviorally and then um, struggling with substance use. And um, he managed to graduate from high school in a very, um, very challenging, uh, you know, sort of a way. But, you know, when I think about heroes, some of his teachers mm -hmm. and certainly um, uh, the administration in his school were amazing with him, That's tried crazy. everything. Um, I think uh, Mr. Burke at South Burlington High School, you know, really is to this day one of, one of Dan's heroes. Um, and mine too, but as a, you know, so his, his um, substance use disorder progressed very severely. He, um, you know, he developed an opioid use disorder. He ended up, um, you know, like is so often the story, going from treatment to treatment and um, program to program. And um, frankly, in the, in the middle of all that, our lives were chaotic and hard and um, uh, and his sister, uh, Melissa, who was such a joyful child, um, you know, of course it severely impacted her sure. and their relationship. And um, I have so much sympathy now for parents and families who are, um, who become fractured by, mm -hmm. um, the impact of substance use disorder. Um, and so um, fortunately for us, as much as I know that it's not true for so many, um, we're at, at this point in it, you know, I, I'd say happy ending, but I know it's, you know, it's never, never quite ending. But right. um, for the past two years, he has been doing really well. It's very stable in recovery. He, he had moved to Florida to go to a program there. Things actually ended up over time getting worse. Um, and again, in and out of various <clears throat> centers. And, and I'm skipping over all the all of the hard, hard, hard stuff. Yeah. I mean, there was some 
you know, bad stuff. Um, yep. And, um, you know, just trying to work all that through and making sure that, um, you know, we try and support him um, all along and I always let him know that he's loved beyond measure and, um, and always being there and yep. um, walking that line between are you doing too much? Are you doing too little? Right. Honestly, often feeling judged, making um, decisions that, you know, we felt were being made out of compassion or sometimes desperation, but sometimes seen as um, enabling or, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so you feel that. I mean, as a parent, you exactly. feel that, and especially in a job like Kids Safe Collaborative, um, feeling like, wait, how can this be happening to my family? Right. And, but, and there's no roadmap. I mean, there's no. You know, uh, right. No. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think obviously, you know, and, um, and, and there were, again, so many places and so many people along the way. You ask what keeps me going. That's what it is. You know, I think about Turning Point Center where you previously worked and um, uh, such a gift. So mm -hmm. important in this community. Mm -hmm. And, um, I had never expected starting out that, you know, our children would be accessing that type of support. And yet there we were. Yep. Um, and yep. in so many places like that, and so many people who have helped along the way that um, we could never thank them all individually. Um, so he eventually just back to back to Dan because he did he did say it was okay to share this story is um, you know he he ended up he was in a in a treatment center he had been blowing out of every treatment center and um, <clears throat> we were pretty much at our wits end but still hanging in there with him as best we could and he had had the opportunity um, from somebody in a recovery center to place him in a um, in a program out of, uh, in, in California. Hmm. And it seemed like a good program. We were always looking at this program, that program, what's covered by insurance, what isn't, what do they do? Right. And this program seemed good. And so they, um, they arranged for his flight. And, and the first time they were there waiting for him and he didn't get on the plane. And then the second time he was there and he failed. And then the third time, <laughs> the, the second time he didn't even make it to the airport. But the third time, after a fairly long period of desperation where we had cut off all financial aid um, and we weren't sending him money ever. We were, you know, paying for a hotel night here or something right. just to keep him safe. It was sort of the, the guardrail approach to parenting. Yeah. Um, you know, you just do what you can for basic safety and, yep. and that's all. Yep. Um, and he had one more opportunity to go his life was pretty much, yeah, pretty bad at that point. Yeah. And he got on that plane and he went to a recovery uh, treatment center in California. And I can't say that was a magic thing, but his life started to turn around hmm. and um, slowly, <laughs> but, but progress in the right direction. Um, he, he said, this is it. This is my time. Um, a really key thing in his life that then happened um, was that my stepmom um, was very ill and they had been really close when he was growing up, very mm. close. And he hadn't seen her in years because of his addiction and the, and the chaos that it wrought. Yep. Um, and so we um, flew out there and, um, had the opportunity to go there. And this is actually in the beginning of COVID. And so there's a whole story about getting to California, but we got there and we had planned to see him. He was in LA and we had planned to see him and then go see my mom. And he said, no, I, I have to go to, I have to see her. And we were assessing, is he, is he healthy enough to go? Right. And we were so impressed. He was, he, he really was. And so we brought him and, um, she passed away shortly thereafter and he was, he was there. We were all there. He was there. And um, I think it had 
a profound influence on him mm -hmm. and really solidified the direction he was going. He mm -hmm. shortly after that decided he wanted to pursue a nursing degree and he um, has now since then enrolled in, in um, uh, college in a pre-nursing program. He moved actually to Santa Barbara where I lived and uh, where she still was and is living there now and mm -hmm. uh, really changed his, his life. And he said two things recently. One is he's gotten very into weightlifting and going to the gym. And he says, I wish I could tell everybody like, in a treatment center to, to, to do that, to exercise and to, yes. so kind of very, I mean, again, he's small in stature, but he's living, lifting these big weights. And, um, <laughs> so that really changed him. The other thing that I thought was really insightful was um, that he said he, he doesn't want to minimize COVID, but he had the having to be alone was a really important thing in his life to make him get comfortable with himself. He That's said, I've that. never been comfortable with like just wow. being, and he was a kid who always needed people around. Yeah. Yeah. And as a little kid, that was, that was fine. You're very social, <clears throat> but he said he never felt really comfortable in, in himself. That's and interesting. Isn't that fascinating? It is. Because, substance yeah, use disorder. Yeah, because a lot of times, you know, I know from my own work that isolation can be the enemy of recovery. But in his case, it was the gift of self-awareness, really getting to understand himself and like himself. Yeah. That's Amazing, wonderful. Isn't it? Whole different perspective. Whole different. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's the beauty of people. No two are the same. Yes, so true. Uh, and and now, you know, a joy is to see him healthy and happy. And, and maybe a bigger like joy is that he and his sister, Melissa, have really, um, it's not wonderful. <laughs> I would say, you know, it's not all but it, roses and whatever, but it's, um, they're taking steps. And Melissa especially is, is um, you know, working on, you um, forgiving or or you know mm -hmm. and, and daniel has worked hard to try and make amends throughout but in particular that relationship um is you know is so fundamental and for us as parents to see um you know to see them start to again at least have some communication and yeah. and um able to be with each other melissa um you know, also an amazing kid, did, yeah. you know, really tell well. Me, and, uh, tell me about Melissa. What, uh, what, what did, what, tell me about her. Did she go to college? Yeah. So she, um, you know, in, in high school, she was very active in a, in a lot of ways. She did dance and she did um, also some, you know, justice focused things and um, bigger picture things. And, and then she ended up going to the University of San Francisco. Mm. And that wasn't on her short list to start with, but um, uh, ended up being a, a really great opportunity for her to move to San Francisco. And um, uh, she's just blossomed. I think it was important for her to get away again, yeah. her, you know, <laughs> through her teenage years as she she was amazing and um to be honest and especially looking back things were pretty chaotic with mm -hmm. you know with a brother who's yeah. struggling with a substance use disorder and everything that goes along with that you know disappearing jewelry and you yeah. can't leave your credit card out and all of those right. things and um and not to mention the explosive behaviors and things that we struggled every which way to work with him on, but, but clearly it has an impact. It's that, you know, that trauma that impacts the whole family. Um, exactly. And now she's, she graduated from USF and she has a great job um, in the neuroscience uh, lab um, at the University of uh, California, San Francisco. And wow. um, live in, I mean, to be in your young 20s and living in downtown San Francisco is yeah. uh, pretty awesome. And 
um, has a wonderful partner and they just moved in together and they're happy and um, oh. Oh, it's such a joy. And so that's, <laughs> yes, what is it, what keeps you going? You know, a lot about my work and I'm so dedicated to it, but um, there's nothing like the joy of seeing your kids do well. Absolutely. That's wonderful. Uh, that is wonderful. Uh, so, well, um, so um, back to you for a second here. Yeah. Um, any, you know, you've had a very distinguished career. Have you any awards that you've gotten recognized for your good work? Any, uh, any, I also like to hear what words of wisdom you would have for the audience about uh, life. <laughs> well, I've, I've been um, privileged to have been, you know, recognized in many ways for my work and, um, you know, and, and I truly believe it's an honor to have the opportunity to have that kind of a recognition. Um, mm -hmm. Probably most significant to me is the um, uh, Queen City Police um, Award. Uh, it's the Antonio Parmelo Award. And um, it was presented to me by Senator Leahy and um, someone who I really admire for his work championing the championing the rights of victims and of women, um, the mm. Violence Against Women Act. He was, you know, yeah. he, he's just such an important voice for justice. So that was very meaningful. Um, Wonderful. You know, a, a number. I, you know, I, I will share sort of at the, at the end of this that um, just about uh, a little over two years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer. Mm. And I've been very open about that. Um, you know, created a, a caring bridge page and put it on my, you know, on my Facebook and whatever that people can check it out. I, I think it's really important to be forthcoming and open. And I've been very fortunate to have been able to tolerate the treatments really well. Um, and, uh, but I'm still in treatment. It's just kind of another thing that I've incorporated into my life. <laughs> and, um, and that was part of why we had been able to go to California. I had the opportunity to receive a, the gift of a, of a private flight out there because I, you know, couldn't risk the exposure of a commercial flight, and um, received treatment at UCLA, and um, and that was really helpful. And so again, I, but Gary, the thing that's been most um, uh, profound has just been the support the the people mm -hmm. who come forward in ways that you um, you just don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I drink a, a, my coffee every morning out of a cup that says you've got this. And that was a wonderful gift from a friend and colleague and another friend who sends me letters once or twice a week, for beautiful cards, wow. and just, She's wow. you know, such a close friend and so valued. And I think back to like that third grade teacher of mine and um, yeah. that, yeah. you know, the way that the people around you respond in a crisis or in a traumatic situation makes yeah. all the difference in how we cope. And yeah. I we kind of know that from trauma research, but I have had the opportunity to experience that oh. firsthand. And so while I wouldn't wish cancer on anyone, Right. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's amazing the the gifts of love and caring and compassion that I received and and my husband Joe um, as well. I mean, gifts to our family and his support of me has mm -hmm. been you know invaluable. And I I probably don't say that enough to him, <laughs> but um, you know, my family's been so That's supportive great. and so important and. You don't always stop to recognize. We start each yeah. day now with gratitude. Yep. We verbally, you know, we verbalize our gratitude um, and makes you stop and yes. consider those things. Well, you, you're making me think of the Beatles line, the love you give is equal to the love you get. Yeah. Giving a lot of love to people, getting it back. Well, thank you. It's uh it's um, it's amazing, and it's you know one of those uh, profound life lessons that you you know that you learn from going through that. So yeah, yeah and you and I are both old enough to remember all those old Eagles songs. 
<laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. so is there anything we've missed? Anything you want to make sure that you have an opportunity to talk about before we close? I think I touched on so many things, okay. Gary. You asked great, great questions. And um, great. Uh, I just am so grateful for the opportunity to do this. Uh, okay. It's really, uh, you know, it's a, a joy, a pleasure. And um, again, really just um, heartwarming. So great. thank you. You're thank welcome. You. And thank you. It's nice to spend an hour with you, Sally. I know. It's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Thanks. Take sure. care. You too. Okay.